everywhere we go, everywhere we go, where the Bromley boys making all the noise, everywhere we go. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another edition of From Bromley with Love. Of course, I'm your host, Marshall St. Patrick Hewitt, and I'm excited today to have with me uh, Trevor Nell. I'd like to think that for anybody who is a non-league football fan, from the National League down, to be fair, because Trevor covers so much of non-league football step one through to i'd say step six um sometimes step seven depending on where trevor is at any what any point in time um but i, I reached out to trev because i said to him you know what there's a big game on saturday bromley versus barnet at hayes lane fa trophy quarter final um and i said like, i need to get a barnet fan on and the, the the biggest barnet fan i know is trevor um and in the context particularly for those of you Bromley fans, probably more so who watched the last show with Cole, where we looked at the last 10 games of the season. We said on that show that that Bromley Barnet game is actually more, is a bigger game than people realise in terms of implications for fixtures and potential pileups and so on and so forth. And the way it's worked out, Barnet are now second at the time of recording, having beaten Rochdale on Tuesday. Uh, Bromley went to Oldham and got a nil-nil draw, which puts Barnet ahead of Bromley by two points in the National League table. They are still the two front runners for the direct buy into the playoff semi-finals. You can't, to be fair, Trev, after that long intro, you can't really get, unless Chesterfield were in the FA Trophy um, at this stage, there isn't a bigger game than this right now in terms of the FA Trophy uh, quarterfinals. It's second uh, third versus second in terms of Bromley being at home. First things first, let's go straight into it before I, because before I go into the kind of Barnet season. How are you feeling about that game? Let's get straight to the crux of it. Bromley fans are divided. Some want us to pick our best team and try win it. Some are like, well, if Barnet wins, so be it. Like That's their problem, having to negotiate the FA Trophy semi and potential final. Where do you stand on it as a Barnet fan? Are you prepared to try and get to Wembley twice? Do you mind if you lose? Off you go. I'm definitely happy to try and get to Wembley twice. We we, we tried it last year. We got to the semi-finals last year. We finished in the playoffs last year. We stumbled into the playoffs last year because we were we weren't strong in depth. This year we're a lot stronger. And even even though we've had as many as eight first team players out the last uh, three or four weeks, we've still managed to win games, stay up there with Bromley and still progress in the trophy. Um, Saturday, I'm looking at, it's going to be tight. I've, I, I would pretty much say one goal will settle it either way um, or I think both sides are going to go help, help, help for leather. Would you say Barnet win? Let's just say argument say Barnet win that game on Saturday. Yeah. Would it be I asked Colin this on Monday from a Bromley perspective. Would it be a bad season? Or how would you view it, rather, as a Barnet fan, if Barnet got to the trophy final, won it, but didn't get yeah. promoted? Now, that's a very good question, because that question really divides our fan base as well. Uh, the last time Barnet made, to, made it to Wembley was 1972. That's three years before I was born. Uh, you know, a good two generations worth of Barnet fans have not seen their side at Wembley. Um, fans remember silverware. Players remember what league they play in. Um, you couldn't get a much tougher, um, a much tougher question. You go onto our only Barnet forum, and you'll find people saying, "Let's bin off the trophy, and let's go for, and let's go for the playoffs." But we, you know, if you win Saturday, you're 90 minutes from Wembley. You could get to the playoffs, take that bye lose in the next round not even get to Wembley um you know with Dean Dean Brennan's won the competition with Gray's in the past he loves this competition he wants to win it again that's why we go strong every single game he's not prepared to to rest and play I wouldn't call it a week a week 11 um because as I said we are that much stronger in depth this year but he'll go strong Saturday the strongest 11 he will pick guarantee it yeah no, to be fair I think Andy Woodman's doing the exact same um, the last time I, I spoke to Andy, um, when we beat oh, Chippenham uh, to get to this state, or Avely, in fact, to get to this stage, um, Andy said, I want to win the competition. And, I, and, and I was, I'll was i be honest, I was a bit taken aback because obviously as a manager, you kind of have to say that. But he was like uh, vehement that 
no, we're, I'm playing the strongest team I can play. We're, we're going to try and go for this. And I guess Barnet are similar to Bromley in so much as, and you may disagree, but Barnet are similar to Bromley in so much as both of us made the playoffs last year, right? Barnet fell at the yeah. first hurdle to Warren Wood. We uh, beat Woke and then lost to Chesterfield. We didn't have the strength in depth to go up last year. No way whatsoever. And if we got past Chesterfield, you have to assume Notts County would have done us at Wembley anyway, right? Similarly, I look at yeah. Barnet last year and think, yeah, they had a great season and actually probably overachieved um, last season. I don't know what the Barnet perspective is on that, but um, this season, similar to Bromley, they just appear to have quality cover in nearly every single position on the pitch but give me the give me the give me the barnet blow by blow and go back to last season if you must because it's yep. weird because dean brennan <laughs> i sometimes think he's a bit of a marmite manager in the league because he's so forthright in his opinions right um and sometimes i think and if you think i've got it wrong please correct me sometimes i think people can see his comments and say oh that's a bit full on but then i think that's just his style that's just the way um he is and you can't say that he doesn't get a tune out out of his squad he did last year he's done even better this year but tell me the dean brennan story and for the bromley fans who will undoubtedly be listening to this as well as the barnet fans uh, and any other fans that tune in barnet are, are a weird case because <laughs> two years ago or maybe more you had harry kuehl you look like you're in an absolute mess I remember the game, actually, and you may have come to it. We beat you 2-0, I think, at Hayes Lane, and it might be one of the last few matches Harry Kuehl managed. In fact, he might have got sacked yeah, straight right. after that game. I can't remember. Did, yeah. Club, you're right. yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah the club then looks unrecognisable to what it is now. So mm. talk me through that story. Yeah, Mash, you're absolutely spot on. Um, you know, when they when both both came to the club, Dean and Harry, at the same, same time, there was a little bit of a, a thought of, you know why? Why have we got a director of football at that level, and then appointed someone who's who who did it at the top level, but as a manager, shown that he couldn't do he couldn't do it. And seven games into the season, he pretty much showed he couldn't do it at this level. And ever since Dean's taken over, it's taken it's taken two years to get to this level. Um, when he first took over, we were in the bottom. We were bottom of the table. We had two points from seven games, mm. and he dragged he dragged us up. We finished. 17th uh, or 18th i think it was the 18th and we took some right beatings fives and six nils from sides and dean got some he got some got some flat really got some flat having been stuck with a lot of harry's players um last year he was able to ship some of those out in the summer which then allowed him to bring some of his players in um and again we most of us were looking at if we finish Somewhere between 12th and 16th, we'll take that. That's an improvement on 18th. Have a bit of a run in the trophy. We'd be quite happy. And before you know it, we were shooting up the table. I think we led it after three games, three or four games till we went to Chesterfield and lost lost 3-1 there. We were 2-1 two, one, two, one down. Um, and we hit the post through Gorman. Would have made it 2-2. Two, two. Ball cannoned out for a throw-in. Chesterfield broke from the throw-in, made it 3-1 by margins like that but we went toe to toe with a side that we knew were streets in front of us last last season that was in that was early august um so to finish fifth last year was miles in front of where we thought we would be we actually thought this year would be the year we made that kind of stride in the playoffs and then summertime this year he's gone one better he's upgraded on players that he had the year before which he naturally needs i think andy woodman's done exactly the same this year as well which is why both sides are sitting um in second and third and still you know if i'm honest i think we're punching above our weight um not in terms of budget i know that becomes a very contentious thing across the league and any fan you talk to you know everybody's got a bigger budget than than your club but um you know I, I, if you if you look at it on the state of our attendances, our attendances don't support a big budget. Simple as that. It comes from Tony's pocket, um, and if he doesn't want to put the money in, he doesn't want to put the money in. So there's there's a little bit of having to manage manage your money and manage your, manage it well enough to get enough good quality players in. But there are a lot of people that want to play for him. There's people that he's he's had played for him in the past. 
which he's brought in again, which again relates to some of his comments, I think, in some of his interviews where he knows how to push the buttons on those players and get the right reaction. It's backfired a couple of times on on one or two, I don't think, of taking it the right way. Um, and again, you know, that's, that's down to their personality. But um, a lot of it I look at, if it was me, I'd be looking at it and going, cool, why is he digging me out for that? And that would actually, yeah. me as a person, it would encourage me to go into training on Monday morning and do one better and then show him that I deserve to be starting next Saturday um, and, you know, pulling on a Barnet shirt. It's not for everybody. Um, it's uh, it's almost as if it's calmed down the last few weeks. There haven't been quite so many hoo-hahs and people raising eyebrows, whether that's just because we've been performing better or he's got now his squad that he knows will take us forward for the rest of this season and hopefully it delivers, you know, a playoff win in May. Well, hopefully not. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, um, what is, what's Barnett's natural level? What do you think? As a, and again, again, Barnett fans listen to this, I'm sure. Some of you will disagree with whatever Trev says. Some of you will agree and do, do comment below whatever you feel. But ever since Barnett came down, um, I've been, and you've mentioned the attendances. So, and and I hope you take this the right way, Trip. When yeah. we go to Barnet, like Bromley are a, are a small club in terms of history in the context of we're not an EFL club, we've got no EFL history, but we are a growing club, right? So, yeah. not that attendances matter, but you'd say that Bromley average more than Barnet probably across a yeah. season, right? Barnet yeah. tend to get big attendances versus like your Boreham Woods and your Wildstones and so on and so forth, right? And then your big, big games. Um, but are Barnet, <clears throat> sorry, in your mind, a historic non-league club or a League Two club? What's you, what do you see as your natural level? I see we're somewhere stuck in the vacuum in the middle. Uh, yeah. We're I wouldn't say we're too big for non-league because that's where that's where Barnet came from originally, and I wouldn't say we're, we're you know we're definitely not a big club in League Two. A lot of the attendance reasons. I think come from the move to the hive. Yeah. Um, although, you know, I would also counter that and say that, you know, when I used to go to Underhill as well, tendencies were never big there. Um, so you can't just use that, I don't think, as an as an excuse. There's a lot a lot behind the scenes that isn't right from a customer experience point of view. Um, and I do spend a lot of time, I've always said when Tony does Tony Cantos, the chairman, does something good, I'll praise him. When it's not good. I'll criticise him because I think that's that's an even deserve, you know, along the way. And, you know, we had silly things last season, I think it was, um, with food, with simple things like dryers not working, hand dryers not working in the toilets. It's just like mm. that simple, basic match day stuff you expect. And, um, you know, I, I, I went on a massive, not a massive great rant. Um, I just put it out there because I know... I've known for, I think, about three or four years that my blogs get read. They get back to them as well. Mm. So I can have some kind of, you know, of effect to a way pretty much, you know, for what I think is, you know, basic stuff that our fans should deserve. Um, so a lot of our, our, um, apathy comes from that as well. People don't like the experience, so they don't come. But what a lot of people as well are quick to forget as well, we're in the shadow of, two clubs that have 60,000 seat stadiums that sell out on the week they're at home you know we counter one or the other whichever weekend we're playing and yeah. in a lot of effect we are people's second club in north london um all the time though the premier league is pricing people out of the game it is drawing people back into non-league and you know not just at our level at national league you, like you said go right the way down to step five and six and you see some fantastic figures um I I still feel personally that you know the club can do more to get people in. They've got they've got a fantastic affiliate scheme with a lot of the local um, junior clubs. Mm. Um, so Saturday fixtures nicely populated. Tuesday nights are always our problem when the kids can't come because they've got school the next day and, and we really suffer. But it's not in a great area of what you've got around it. 
you've literally got the bars inside the ground. You've not got much else around, um, at least where we were at Barnet originally. You had the pubs in the high street. You had a pub at the top top of Underhill as well, or the bottom of bottom of the hill, I should say. Um, you know, it was just a bit better situated, but I think it's something that we'll struggle if we get our move back to, to Barnet as Tony's plans that came out a couple of weeks ago of going back to our roots and where we were. Another 500, 1,000 maybe on there, but there is, I think, just a limit to it because you've got that catchment area of so many big clubs around you, so you are constantly fighting for that attention. For the benefit of the non-Barnet fans watching this, so obviously I think it came out about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, the stadium plans and so on and so forth. So I didn't read enough about it to, to kind of be all fay with the story, but where in Barnet are they planning to go? And is it a is it a speculative plan or you think this is definitely going to happen? What he's aiming to do is go to South Underhill, which was exactly where we wanted to go originally. So basically where Underhill was, which is now a school, we wanted mm. to build behind that on the cricket ground playing field there. So that's exactly where he's going back to where he wanted to go. And to give him his due, despite a lot of people not believing it, he always said when we moved to the Hive 10 years ago, find me a plot of land that I can build on in Barnet and we'll have a ground in Barnet. Um, a lot, a lot of people, funny enough, within 48 hours, the council came out and said, um, you know, it's not happening. This isn't going to happen, blah, 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 blah. And, of course, from the 24 hours of it being announced, the people, you know, were really excited that we're going back to Barnet, that the council put the kibosh on it. And I just turned around and said, look, they're not going to come out and go, this is fantastic. We back everything. You know, we're in the midst of a, you know, a political unrest i should say where you don't know if we're gonna have a change of government or or whatever they don't want to come out and back it just like that because how would that look to all their constituents and the people living right in the vicinity of it they're gonna go you prove it benefits the community and everything and then we'll take it from there um mm. i think i think people read a little bit too much into it you know and when tony came out with the plans on the monday he said i've been talking about this with the council for the last four years now, you don't just stick a statement out like that with grand plans mm. after four years if the council have, have at any point in that time said not going to happen. So you keep your fingers crossed, you touch wood, you know, that it is definitely going to happen. And say it, say it does. Are you like, have you grown to what's the, I don't mind the hive, funnily enough, as an away fan. I don't mind it. Um, it's a bit. I mean, it's a bit kind of like um, retail parkish in terms of just in the middle of nothing. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah. it's, it's an actual aesthetic. I don't actually mind it as an actual aesthetic ground. <laughs> Have you grown to reluctantly love it, or are you excited to hopefully get back to Barnet? Um, that's that's a bit of a difficult one, Mash, because um. Before I was a Barnet fan, I was Maidstone okay. because I lived in Kent. Uh, I was brought, I was born in Kent, brought up in Kent. My dad took me to watch Maidstone. Then they disappeared when they were in the football league, so I followed them all the way through to there. And because they started back right the way down beyond what I would even watch at step seven, you know, we would say they would probably be something like eleven or twelve. Um, yeah. I was, you know, I wasn't interested in going watching part. They were literally playing against my middle brother's village team. That's how far they they dropped them down. So I'd gone to, I think I'd not watched the game for an entire season, gone to Barnet with my brother and one of his mates because from where we were in Seven Oaks, one training to London, one tube straight to Barnet, five minute walk down the hill and you were there. Magic, easy. Um, and that was 30... 30 years ago last year. Um, right. Underhill was lovely because non-league, it was rustic. The problem was it was falling apart. There was no, there was no way you could expand around because if you had houses on two sides, an access road on the third side and then the playing field. So all you did with Underhill was spend money on it, stick a sticky plaster on 
and then while that one was sticking one was falling off somewhere else you were just pouring money down mm. a, a dead drain as lovely as it was um and you know what because because i think because i watch a lot of football and understand a lot of different things i've had my own involvements in clubs and that i maybe look at things maybe not slight so sentimentally maybe um and for me it had to happen you couldn't sustain playing football league at underhill it just wouldn't 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 suffice um so the move to the hive was possibly not done in the best way maybe um that people would have understood it a bit better so to be going to be going back for me i'm i'm personally not not fast and a lot of people might take umbrage to this but i don't mind where i watch us play football um so long as it's the experience is great because that's the major part of it um mm -hmm. the football on the pitch is good and you know we're actually maybe supported slightly better than what we are at the moment um you know the hive as you say the hive's great as a training facility you know, clubs up and down the country would, you know, trade a left arm or a right arm for it. It's that that good. But um, I think stadium wise is stadium wise these days, any new builds are just, you know, yeah, yeah. put together like Meccano kits, aren't they? A bit. So, um, you know, I wouldn't be, I say I wouldn't be sad to go. I wouldn't, I won't miss the journey around the M25 via Heathrow getting stuck on a Tuesday evening and taking me three hours. It'd be slightly less to get to, um, to a new underhill um so I, i'd happily take that after after 10 years of, of traipsing around <laughs> um, 25 but yeah i think that's that's kind of my view on it yeah i hear you so let's look at the squad pivoting back to the game and the season in general um I wrote down earlier on, I was like, who are the standout Barney players? Because when you played us earlier in the season, that was right at the... It was on TV, actually. Um, second game of the season, Bromley. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We were carrying a few injuries. We didn't win off in our first five. Now, some Bromley fans will say, oh, Barney caught us at a good time. But even from that second game of the season, even, yes, I'll put the caveat of Bromley not being at complete full strength, blah, blah, blah. Barnet, it looked easy for Barnet that day. It looked very, very straightforward and easy, right? And it's kind of been like that for Barnet most of the season. Sometimes I feel like when I watch Barnet games, if they've been on BT or I've caught some highlights, it almost looks like sometimes they're beating teams with the handbrake on. Like they're not even going full tilt. Um, sometimes it looks like that, right? So I wrote down some players that have stood out for me this season. Let me know if I'm missing someone. Obviously, Kabam, everyone will talk about Kabam because of the goals. They everyone will, in the same way people yep. always look at Bromley and say Michael Cheek without thinking about anything else, right? Yeah. Uh, Hartigan, yep. Hartigan to me stands out. Yep. Uh, yep. Absolutely. Danny Collins yep. at centre back, I think he was a quality signing. Um, yep. I think yep. I think yep. a lot of clubs slept yep. on Danny Collins and should have got him. Obviously, Dover were rubbish, uh, but Collins stood out even then when Dover were rubbish the season they basically Correct. jacked it in. Um, Gorman. I think has been a great yeah he's been a great experienced head um uh, um in 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 the middle of the park he, this guy doesn't play as much right but every time i've seen him mm. armstrong every time i've seen him i've yeah. been like ah oh. i'll be like oh this guy has got serious talent but he's not a first team starter who else who else am i missing that i should be talking about oh zach brunt have i missed out zach brunt sorry who, who, who else? Who else should I be talking about? Um, more recently, um, Adam Thompson is coming on loan from Leighton Orient. Um, mm. Old school defender. Uh, we've lost Adi Aluru for the season uh, with an knee injury. He's actually been very good as well. First season in in um, full time football from Chelmsford. Very good signing. Um, mm. But yeah, Adam Thompson's been really, really strong for us. He missed. Uh, which game did he miss? Chesterfield, I think it was. Um, and you could you, you could just see there was a little bit missing from from the back line. We were very, very, very patched up. Um, but yeah, you've picked you you've picked the one. I'd say I'd probably just add Callum Stead to that at the moment. He's um you know we've we've had Kabamba out. He's been flying with goals. There another two on Tuesday night against Rochdale. Um, and Zach Brunt, as you mentioned, Zach's had a uh, I'd say a bit of an up and down season. He was um, 
when he when he first first started the season, it looked as if we were we were looking at it and going, he's going to be playing balls that people aren't going to read. We're going to have a bit of a problem here because his brain's two seconds in front, and you know he he's had a little bit of a dip off in form, and all of a sudden the last month and a, about month and a half six weeks he suddenly clicked again, and um, Tuesday night um, he he took the penalty for us, which. I thought was a was it was a I didn't think it was a good penalty. It was a nice height for the keeper to save. And I remarked on Twitter on on um, on Wednesday morning. I mean, he's only he's only twenty two. He's had two loan spells at Bournemouth and South End prior to us. Um, he didn't make an appearance for Sheffield United, so he's not had a lot of football. But being at his age, I kind of expected that you know the penalty had been saved, and he could have just shirked. And disappeared from the game and just and this is on 35 minutes you know and just disappeared but he didn't he went back out and he dictated and influenced the rest of that game as well he was involved in everything um i just thought as a bit of a sign of maturity of someone who hit his age to just not not let it affect him you know and we still went on and won the game as well it didn't it didn't matter that we've missed the penalty it would have been lovely to have scored it but um yeah he's had a great a great a great couple of months again so um, we've almost got everybody fit as well. I think everyone, bar Lou, will be back in three weeks' time. So that final little run in, um, we should be at full strength. But just going on to Marvin, um, I love Marvin a lot because I saw him at Worthing, which is 20 minutes down the road from where I am, you know, near Little Hampton at the moment. So I saw loads of Marvin um, and box to box player, loves running with the ball. Um, and a lot of teams don't like it. They don't like players running at them. Um, and obviously last year we brought him in his first year in um, in full-time football, so it's taken him a little while to adjust. And I think he's found a little bit that there are games that suit him and there are games that don't. Um, depending on how we want to play and how we want to get, I think it teams depends on whether Marvin starts or whether he comes from the bench. And a lot of times last year he either had 60 minutes in him and then he was blowing or 20 minutes from the bench and his impact was you know was just as good then um and i don't think it's quite it hasn't quite kicked for him i think this year just in the way in the way that that dean's wanted to play you've got hartigan dictating everything uh and at times we've played with i say two defensive midfielders gormo's played as well but you've then also got harry pritchard and you've got zach brun so yeah, Pritch as well. Yeah, so um, you know, you, you've just got so many options. And again, this is just something we didn't have last year. We would, we, you know, we'd have to play the same eleven the same way. Tuesday night, we play with the back four. We I don't. We've done that more than two or three times this season. Um, you know, we were able to do that. We've had we've had games where we've played three at the back, but we've had the personnel in that starting eleven to switch to a back four and then switch back to a three again. Um, so you know it, um, you know it's a it's a bit unfortunate for him, I think, because he's he's, he's got goals in him as well, um, and obviously because I've seen so much of him and that, I love him to bits. But it's just not always getting the rub of the green in the starting eleven. Mm. So let me try and get. Actually, I'll end with two things. Firstly, last season. So last season, as you correctly uh, stated earlier on. Semi-finals at Gateshead, um, in the sorry FA Trophy semi-final defeat at Gateshead, um, and then playoff eliminator uh, defeat versus Boreham Wood. Um, first question. So that's the first question. Was any of that disappointing? Having done so well across the season, what was the immediate feeling? once the season had finished against Boreham Wood? Was it, oh, well, actually, they've done us proud this season, or was there a hint of, could have been a bit more than what we were, even though it was, like, overachieving, what was the immediate feeling? Um, I think from both cases, we'd definitely be disappointed having to have got so close, especially in the trophy. We were one away from Wembley. Um, the semi-finals, maybe not so, but um, I think not having... That experience with uh, within the squad um, of you know not getting that far um, made it that you know maybe and I think again you know with the playoffs 
we overachieved um, a fair bit. And but Bournemouth have got that knack. They've been there so often. Um, it was, you know, we kind of got done by two sucker punches, which you'd hope by the time we get to this year, we've learned from that. We've got players in the squad that have won promotion before, like Jordan Cropper, Reese Hill Johnson won it with Wrexham last year. So, you know, you'd hope we've got that extra bit up there in the head, you know, just to go that one step further. And then finally, then this season, say you end second or third, whichever one, straight to the playoff yeah. semis. If this season you didn't make the trophy final, so let's say you beat us, let's say you beat us on Saturday and yeah. you're in the trophy semis, um, and then you get second or third and you're in the playoff semis, if you didn't make it to the final in one of them, irrespective of if you won, if you didn't make yeah. it to the final in one of them, because this is what Bromley fans, I think, have to contend with as well. If we don't make yeah. it to the final in one, I can see some Bromley fans claiming we've had an horrible, we've had a horrible season, <laughs> so, or we've or we've or we've fumbled it and we've choked at the at the um, at the death, even though we're technically overachieving, right? Um, yeah. What do you think? The how do you think Barnet fans would react if you don't make it? To the final in one of those in one of those particular things, I think that would be that would be disappointing this year. Um, mm. When you look at the table, and we've won we've won twenty one games. Only Chesterfield have won more games. You know, Bromley have won eighteen. You know, no one's no one's won more games than us two than Chesterfield in front of us. That we, you know, by clear the best two sides I think in there. So I think not to make the final in at least one would be very disappointing um it might just show that we're still just that little bit short which i think we are in places i think we still concede too many goals um and we've lost too many games this year where we should have won games where we've not been clinical enough um so yeah definitely definitely not getting to at least one of these finals if you know we we've, we've got the opportunity to be in the fa trophy semi-finals i think would you know would be a disappointment but it's then, can you go one better again the next year? And you, you, it's like you saw what I was going to actually ask you as the very end. As a Bromley fan, and I speak for myself, not for other Bromley fans, there is a feeling in the back of my mind that irrespective of what happens this season, we have reached a point where Andy Woodman's name will be mentioned when bigger mm. clubs and quote unquote better jobs become available and they sh and his name should be mentioned i hasten to add do you feel the same about dean brennan do you feel he is now someone who or maybe already is but let's say now becoming someone whose name will rightly be mentioned say barnet even if they did or didn't go up actually that another club might be like hold a minute look at the job he's been doing over there let's have some conversations i is that a fear or concern of yours um, it's already happened. Uh, oh, we had it two, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we had it two years ago. Um, there was some interest in him, which is why Tony gave him a long three-year contract. Mm. Um, he was linked earlier in the season with Burton Albion, uh, pretty much because John Dreyer, our old assistant manager, is the assistant there. Uh, so people put two and two together and and, and got five. But um, you know, when you do well you expect to be in the shop windows it, it's the same for players um i'll quite happily point to adam hinchwood who's just gone to york um i know firsthand of everything he's done down here at worthing and um you know they've been expecting approaches because he's been successful people see what he does and those type of managers are in demand it's great it's great to see people like Adam moving up a division like Stuart Maynard going from Wildstone to Notts County. There are some great, great managers in non-league. Dean Brennan, Andy Woodman's done fantastic at, at, at Bromley. And as you say, it's a progressive club that he's making it progress as well on the pitch. And obviously Robin's making it progress off the pitch, mm. you know, with all the surroundings you've got around Hayes Lane as well. So um, it wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me to see him linked with places. Um, I'm lucky he's a great friend of, of mine who, who I've got to know uh, on a really personal basis. Um, but he'd still be the same if if 
um, he went somewhere else. I've got relationships with other managers that have been in places that have gone to other clubs and, you know, we still talk and, and, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, I, you know, if we don't go up, he's still got, I think, another year on his contract. Um, and a lot of clubs won't pay compensation. Um, mm. He'll move if it's the right move for him. Um, he won't go just for the sake of, you know, someone maybe one league higher if the package doesn't fit, if the ethos of the club doesn't fit. Um, he has a good, he has a good relationship with with Tony. Not not every one of our managers can say they've had that in the in the past. So that obviously counts for something. Um, and again, the same, you know, the same. I'd say exactly the same for Andy as well. If before we do or don't go up, you know, clubs will be looking in the summer and saying, "I'll, you know, want you to replicate what you've done at Bromley or what you've done at Barnet Dean and do it here." You look at Andy's record of bringing, you know, the younger players in, like like yourself. I've ha- had the opportunity to see Kellen and Ben Crowhouse when they were on loan at Cray, and mm. he, he, you could actually tell then, you know, these these two have actually got something about them, and I'm really not surprised to see them you know, to see them go. And that's, again, the sort of things the Football League clubs will now look at because if you can produce your own players, you know, there's a little gold mine, you know, going forward. So, yeah, I expect both of them to be in demand, whether they're a National League manager or a Football League manager come the summer. Fair. Listen, Trev, it's been a fantastic conversation, as I expected it to be so. I said to you, People won't know that we tried to record this about four hours earlier. <laughs> so we got, <laughs> we, we, got, we got there in the end. But listen, I just want you um, to, to to end this particular episode by just, sorry, plugging all the different things you do. For those watching, obviously you can see Trev's tagline there, www.footballwriting.co.uk. I'd like to think certainly some of the Bromley fans already know this. I know some of you already know Trev and follow Trev's writings um, on the Bromley, from Bromley with Love Substack page. I link to Trev's blog there so you can see it on the recommended links on from Bromley with Love to go and follow uh, Trev's stuff. But Trev, plug what you're doing because I know you've got something new and exciting on the horizon as well. So the forum's over to you to let people know what you're doing and what you've, you're you planning to do. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. www.footballwriting.co.uk is my main blog site, but it's got a mixture of stuff on there for both paid and free subscribers. Um, so you can get a bit of everything if you want to pay for it or just want to read the free stuff. Please feel free. I've also got my own Barnet blog as well, which is also on Substack, which is trevernell.substack.com.com. And that is literally just all, all Barnet stuff on there. That's all free. And then I've got a new venture that starts in about three weeks' time um, where I've, um, I'm setting up a website purely for Sussex non-league football. It's been something I've had in the back of my mind for something like about four, five years, I think. Someone else actually had the idea didn't follow it through and i've kept it in the back of my brain and where are all the local newspapers i don't know what it's like around the rest of the country but down here in sussex they're so so thin on sports coverage not just for football but for uh, for for absolutely anything um i thought there's a gap in the market there's a niche that's what i want to do and i've actually got somebody who's um kind of coming into partnership with me to help bring along and do a lot of the backroom stuff while I can create the content. Um, so we're, uh, yeah, we're about T minus three weeks away from launch at the moment. We're hoping 28th of March, just before Good Friday, will be uh, up and underway. And that's for all the Sussex clubs from step two at the moment, it's the highest all the way down to step six. So hoping they'll all get involved. Um, it's you know we're we're putting it together for for them to showcase what they've got as a club, um, which the newspapers can't because they just aren't the journalists around to cover it anymore. So we'll hope that that gives them a right platform, and that will be called www.snlf.co.uk. And of course, uh, for those of you who are ex followers or Twitter followers, Trevor, your 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 handle on there is at trevk37. Yes. So people, please do go and follow um, Trev's stuff. The, the the beauty of the non-league community, Trev and I, in fact, I was about to say we've never met, of course we've never met at Cray Games, but um, the beauty of social media uh, and non-league yeah. football is the the community um, 
it, it is so vibrant that you you just know you'll bump into people in non league football. No matter, no matter where you are, you're gonna see them at some game somewhere. So um, Trevor and I met that way, um, and that's why I knew it was a no brainer to get to get Trevor on the show today. And I'm sure those who have listened to it, whether from a Bromley perspective, Barnet perspective, or neutral perspective, um, it's been an educational uh, tour de force from uh, Trev Reed, particularly Barnet Football Club. Needless to say, people, Trev, you, you'll, you'll be there on Saturday, right? Yes, I will be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Trev will be there in our terrible away end, um, and it is <laughs> terrible. Bromley must have one of the worst away ends in the national league. Bromley, Bromley people, if you're listening, we have one of the worst away ends in in the national league. So, sorry, Barnet fans, in advance, you're back again to experience that. But um, Trev will be in the away end uh, amongst the Barnet fans. I, of course, will be um, with the Bromley fans and whatnot. But if you're a neutral, and this 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 pod, this episode is um. In um, interested you by all means get down to the game on Saturday. You're you're talking about the sec the team that's second in the national league versus the team third in the national league. Technically on paper, it is the game of the day when it comes to non league football. It doesn't mean they'll pan out like that, but on paper it is the game of the day. So if you're neutral, do come along. FA Cup, sorry FA Cup, FA Trophy quarterfinal, Bromley versus Barnet, two games away from Wembley. Um, winner takes all. Trev. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on. Final words to you. Brilliant stuff. Thanks for having me, Mash. It's been great to uh, been great to come on. As you said, I've got quite a few Bromley supporting fans as well as yourself, Colin, Rob, Eddie, um, and obviously a lot of other people I know that way as well via via Twitter and that and everything. But yeah, it should be. It's you've got the makings of a very good game. It could be a one nil bloodbath. Who knows? But it's got to be settled on the day. I didn't. I didn't even ask you for your prediction. I've done that on purpose. I don't even want to get into <laughs> predictions. All, all, I, all I will say is, do you know what, Trev? Don't be surprised if this, if this game goes all the way, literally all the way mm. to penalties. Do not be yeah. surprised if we're there for a very long time on, on Saturday. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gents that's been trev nell um i've been Marshall st patrick here this has been from bromley with love stay tuned as always uh comment below if you found that interesting obviously i'll put it on twitter trev will share it as well i would assume uh and if you're watching this on youtube you can comment below that way facebook i'll share it on facebook as well so if you uh, want to interact yeah. with trev and asking some questions get in the comments below and i'm sure trev will respond thank you again trev much appreciate everyone see you soon <laughs>